How was one of the most criminal regimes in the history of the world created? Did Adolf Hitler and National Socialism simply appear out of the blue? What was the phenomenon of Nazism and why was Germany in the 1920s and 30s such a fertile place for this ideology to grow? I will try to answer these questions in this episode of the series Lessons of the Past. Post-war crisis The Great Economic Depression of 1929, which started in the United States, spread not only throughout the American continent, but also to Europe. It reached Germany in 1930, deepening the already difficult situation of the state. This was initiated by the adoption of the extremely strict Treaty of Versailles, which ended the First World War. War reparations for damage caused during World War I were set at 132 billion marks to be paid in gold. That was equal to 33 billion dollars, which accounted for 3% of Germany's GDP paid over 50 years. It was a surrealistically high amount intended to inhibit German imperialism and counteract the growth of Germany's economic power. The treaty also included a number of restrictions in other areas, including numerous territorial losses and reducing the size of the army, navy and air force. The main advocate for tightening the restrictions was France. The main effect of the crisis at the turn of the decade was the fall in prices of industrial and agricultural products, reduced demand thus caused overproduction. The decline in the value of production resulted in the reduction of enterprises and even the bankruptcy of some. The crisis seriously affected economic relations with foreign countries. A significant drop in trade turnover was visible. Unemployment was becoming more and more visible as well, as in January 1928 it amounted to over 1.8 million unemployed, while in 1929 it skyrocketed by almost a million unemployed. In the following years the statistic began to increase drastically. What's more, the situation was worsened by the banking crisis. On July 14, 1931, one of the largest German banks, Darmstädte und Nationalbank, collapsed. National Socialist German Workers' Party, NSDAP The German state was hard hit by the crisis. The difficult situation had an impact on the political situation. Spending on the unemployed caused a severe budget deadlock. On March 27, 1930, the Social Democratic government of Chancellor Hermann Miller collapsed. He was replaced by a centrist government of Heinrich Brüning with 130 deputies. The main task of the new government was to initiate the Osthilfe program, the Aid to the East, which was part of an intervention package aimed at leading the country out of the economic crisis. It was about introducing a deflation policy and patching the deficit in the state budget. The government did not have a parliamentary majority, so in July 1930 elections were called. However, they did not bring about any major changes apart from the great success of the NSDAP or National Socialist Party, which won as many as 107 seats, accounting for 18% of the total number. It is worth noting that up to that point, the party held only 12 seats. The National Socialists won such a large number of seats mainly at the expense of other right-wing parties. Despite the lack of parliamentary support, the Brunig government continued to rule until 1932. During this period, despite numerous economic problems, several successes of Germany in the international arena can be noted. In the spring of 1930, the French, Belgian and British troops occupying the Rhineland were withdrawn, although, according to the Treaty of Versailles, these were to remain there until 1935. German streets were still dangerous. Clashes of paramilitary units of various political groups took place regularly. Conflicts mainly broke out between socialists and nationalists. Yet it was the Nazi militia group, the SA, Sturmabteilung, that grew rapidly. In 1930, they numbered 400,000 members. Nazi organizations were mainly supported by petty bourgeoisie groups, 
shopkeepers, craftsmen and clerks. But universities also joined in, becoming the center of German chauvinism. Ministry of Propaganda The National Socialists won obedience not only with force, but also with propaganda. Radio and cinema were cleverly used, ceremonial marches and parades with banners and torches were organized. Public appearances by leading NSDAP figures, mainly Adolf Hitler, were also important. The narrative of speakers were exceptionally simple, as it was supposed to appeal to the lower class. The leaders of the NSDAP did not have factories, banks or large land estates. Their recipients were also deprived of similar capital. With the rise of the NSDAP, everyone who was dissatisfied with the previous governments began to now see their chance. The Nazis gained more and more successes in elections to national parliaments. In 1930, a member of NSDAP became a minister in Thuringia. In 1931, the National Socialists became a most numerous faction in the parliaments of Oldenburg and Hesse. In the elections to the Prussian Sejm on April 24, 1932, the NSDAP obtained 162 seats out of a total of 420, previously having only 9. Similar successes can also be noted in other parts of Germany. Alongside the parliamentary campaign, the fight for presidency began. Hindenburg's term was ending and in the elections of 1932 he won 19.4 million votes followed by Adolf Hitler with 13.4 million votes. This clearly testified to Hitler's succession to the elite of the German political class. Brüning's government collapsed in May 1932. In its place, the government of Franz von Papen came into existence composed of representatives of the German National Party and non-partisan Prussian Junkers. Yet soon Papen disbanded the Reichstag and on July 31 new elections were held, which brought another and even greater success for the NSDAP. The party won 37% of the vote, which gave them 230 seats. Papen offered Hitler to participate in the government, but Hitler refused, demanding full power. Their request was not complied with and the Papen government quickly collapsed. On November 6, other elections were held, in which the NSDAP suffered minor losses, receiving 33% of the seats. General Kurt von Schleicher became the new chancellor, who offered Hitler the position of vice-chancellor, which he again refused. The refusal was dictated by the desire to gain as much power as possible. This came into reality on January 4, 1933, during a meeting at which Hitler secretly met Papen at the via of the Kiel banker Kurt von Schroeder, who was a liaison between the NSDAP and the great German capital class. During this time, Schleicher struggled to hold on to the government, eventually resigning on January 28. 1933. Two days later, President Hindenburg entrusted the mission of forming a new government to Adolf Hitler. The new Chancellor The appointment of Hitler as Chancellor was a turning point in the history of not only Germany, but also the world. The goal he pursued over the last dozen years finally came into reality. On the day Hitler took office as the Chancellor, a great parade of the SA divisions in Berlin, near the Brandenburg Gate, was held. So far only a coalition government had been created, yet still it was a considerable success for the NSDAP. It was enough power to enable Hitler to implement his plans. On the night of February 27, 28, 1933, the Reichstag fire broke out which the Communists were accused of. But the fire was an NSDAP provocation to crack down on the left. The aftermath of this event was the issuance of the decree on the protection of the nation and the state, which made it possible to abolish civil liberties. 
even before its announcement, about 4,000 to 10,000 communist activists were unlawfully arrested. This significantly facilitated the conduct of the election campaign before new elections scheduled for March 5, 1933. The NSDAP obtained as much as 44% of the votes, that is 228 out of 647 possible seats. The German National Party, aligned with the NSDAP, won 8% or 53 seats. However, it was not enough to pass a power of attorney for the government, which required two-thirds of the votes, so the mandates of communist deputies were invalidated. Eventually, the NSDAP gained the support of the Catholic Central Party and the Power of Attorney Act, passed in March 1933, gave the government the right to issue laws and repeal the constitution for a period of four years. This was extended in 1937 for another four years. The next step for Hitler was issuing on the merger of the presidential government with the office of the Reich Chancellor. It was an executive order abolishing the title of president and ordering the chancellor to be called Führer, that is leader. In this way, Hitler took over as head of state, also being head of government with full legislative power. Meanwhile, other political parties continued to be marginalized. After the Reichstag fire, the communist parties were basically outside the law. Conservative groups favoring Hitler unknowingly committed suicide. On June 27, 1933, the German National Party was dissolved. Similarly with the Catholic Center, which dissolved on July 5. The next elections of November 12 were held for only one NSDAP list. The Reichstag has become a mere facade. Due to the increasing power, most of the administrative and communal posts were held by party functionaries. In 1935, as many as three out of five positions were filled by members of the NSDAP. More and more control was spread over education. Male youth aged 10 to 18 had to belong to the Hitlerjugend and girls to the Union of German Girls. The expansion of the police apparatus became an important tool of the Hitler regime. On April 26, 1933, the symbol of Nazi Germany was created. The secret state police, Geheime Staatspolizei, in other words, Gestapo. The first concentration camps were also established during this period, including Dachau near Munich, where political opponents were imprisoned, as well as ordinary criminals, alcoholics, homosexuals and Jews. In April 1939, the number of those imprisoned reached about 300,000. The Jewish Question At the same time, it should be remembered that the National Socialists considered Jews to be the main opponents of Germany also on economic grounds. They were blamed for all the misfortunes of Germany ascribed to, above all, responsibility for the shape and acceptance of the provisions of the Versailles Treaty. Immediately after Hitler came to power, anti-Semitism began to be surrounded by the majesty of the law and new laws were issued that limited the rights of the Jewish population. As a result, attacks on Jewish shops, synagogues and apartments became regular. On April 1, 1933, a mass boycott of Jewish shops and enterprises were announced. Two years later, on September 15, 1935, the Reichstag passed two more laws that forbade marriage and sexual relations between Jews and Germans, and regulated who could have full political rights while those who only belonged to the state. Jews began to be removed from cultural life, offices, the economy and liberal professions. For example, Jewish lawyers could only defend Jewish clients. On October 28, 1938, Jews of Polish citizenship were ordered to immediately leave the Reich, which moreover was met with a firm refusal to accept them by the Polish state. During that time, the secretary of the German embassy in Paris was murdered by the son of one such family, Herschel Grinspan. This event became a pretext for organizing the so-called Kristallnacht, that is, the pogrom of Jews throughout the Reich. 
Many Jews were murdered and numerous synagogues, shops and apartments were demolished. Subsequently, a contribution was imposed on them. The use of theaters and cinemas was forbidden, as was the driving of cars. Additionally, on November 12, 1938, Jewish industrial, commercial and craft companies were closed. In fact, they were removed from the political, economic and cultural life of Germany. In 1933, Germany was inhabited by over half a million Jews. Six years later, it was less than half. Berwirtschaft, the fight against unemployment and the four-year plan. On July 14, 1933, a law was passed according to which the formation of any other party was subject to up to three years in prison, and this was also extended to trade unions. Moreover, on May 2, 1933, trade unions were dissolved and their property was taken over. Under subsequent laws, entrepreneurs gained complete power over their workers. Statism flourished under the guise of the private economy and the Third Reich put more and more emphasis on heavy industry, the Wehrwirtschaft, serving the military plans of the Führer. The intensification of the road and bridge construction program in 1929 and the development of the automotive industry also remained significant. Fritz Todd became the organizer and manager of motor reconstruction. Full employment in Germany was mainly driven by the motorway construction program in relation to the group of unskilled workers, as well as increased employment in the armaments industries, primarily in the shipbuilding and aviation industries. The increase in the size of the armed forces was also significant. It grew from 100,000 to about 1 million in 1939. However, reducing unemployment in this way had its price. After almost four years of the National Socialist armaments economy, raw material and food reserves were almost completely exhausted. Foreign trade froze due to export difficulties. So, without the influx of raw materials, no further reinforcements were possible. So the Führer's policy began to come to a standstill. Consequently, at the Party Congress in 1936, Hitler announced the introduction of a four-year plan called improving the living standards of the German people. Due to the fact that all forces were directed towards armaments, the nation was required to temporarily give up consumer goods. This plan was met with criticism. The president of the Reichsbank, the minister of economy, Hjalmar Schacht, was skeptical about further expansion of arms and believed that the possibilities of the German economy were exhausted and that he saw further development by including Germany in the world trade system and abandoning the concept of economic self-sufficiency. However, as the president of the central bank, Hjalmar Schacht made it possible to put into circulation the so-called Mefovexel bills of exchange aimed at financing job creation and armaments programs. These promissory notes were issued by the fake company Metallurgische Forschungsgesellschaft and guaranteed by the state in 1934-1938. They covered approximately 30% of the arms expenditure. To implement the four-year plan, a separate office headed by Hermann Göring with far-reaching powers was established. In this way, the armed forces gained significant influence in the German economy. Hitler set the following tasks. The German army must reach combat readiness within four years. And the German economy must be ready for war also within that time. The rearmament of the armed forces was to enable military operations to obtain local territorial gains. Hitler's notes on the key issues of the four-year plan envisaged an increase in the extraction of iron ore regardless of the iron content and neglecting the issue of profitability which caused a serious conflict with the steel industry and Minister of Economy Hjalmar Schacht. Hitler of course ignored these objections which led to Schacht's resignation in November 1937. As a result of measures taken by the authorities, unemployment dropped to less than 1% in 1939. The savings rate increased from 11 to 18% in the 1932-1938 period. 
industrial production doubled and agricultural production increased almost by 10%. At the same time, real wages decreased by 25% and the increase in the production took place mainly in the areas of the armaments industry. Highway to Hell German society was hit hard by the financial crisis at the turn of the 1920s and 30s, which was aggravated by the provisions of the clearly unfavorable to Berlin Treaty of Versailles. Poverty and unemployment were rampant. The proud Germans, descendants of the victorious Junkers from Sedan, were humiliated. Toxic ideologies thrive on the toxic soil. The imperialist actions of Hitler and the National Socialists were, in turn, very well thought out. The gradual unification of the German nation with the Nazi ideology took place on many levels, from ideological to political and economic. Restoring the sense of national pride Limiting the rights of minorities and reducing unemployment made almost every German more and more accepting of the policies of the NSDAP. Brainwashing succeeded. At the same time, the policy of draining domestic resources in the 1930s made war the only solution. It seems that in the minds of the Nazi elite, war had always been the goal, but ordinary Germans started to support this criminal ideology only at the time of poverty and national shame. This does not explain the German crimes, but it shows that the deep humiliation of an opponent after victory does not always turn out to be the optimal solution in the long term. The fetters imposed by the French on Germany in the form of the Treaty of Versailles returned with redoubled strength after 20 years. Hey! Thanks for staying with Good Times, Bad Times. Uh, remember, you can always support the work we do on Patreon. Uh, also remember to leave a like button or a comment for the holy algorithms. Uh, and I will see you next time.